This is the Digital Factory Podcast. I'm John Bruner. Today we'll be talking about 3D printing for railroads. That is a large-scale and demanding application. But first, a few words about the Digital Factory Conference, which is coming to Munich on May 14th. If you like this podcast, you would like the Digital Factory Conference. We'll be talking about all kinds of digital manufacturing technologies. 3D printing, for instance, we have executives from four different 3D printer companies giving talks. That's GE, EOS, HP, and Formlabs. We've also got people giving talks on advanced automation and robotics, on digital design, on supply chains, and on digital transformation, which is an important topic for manufacturing managers and executives these days. To learn more about the program and to register for the conference, visit digitalfactory.xyz, and you can use the code PODCAST for a discount. Again, to learn more about the conference and to register, visit digitalfactory.xyz and use the code PODCAST for a discount. My guest today is Stephanie Brickveda, who runs the additive manufacturing program at Deutsche Bahn. This is the giant logistics company that operates passenger and freight rail services in Germany and around the world. And she is a speaker at the Digital Factory Conference. Stephanie, it's great to have you on the program. Thank you very much for having me. So a lot of us think about 3D printing as a way to create small parts that tend to be perhaps a little more fragile than some of the parts that uh, you might make with conventional methods. Tell us a bit about how you're using 3D printing on a railroad, which seems like a really demanding application. So we are using additive manufacturing for printing spare parts. We don't do any prototypes because we are not a manufacturer. We are a maintainer. And this is why we focus on especially spare parts, which we can't get anymore at the markets. So we solve our obsolescence problems with uh, additive manufacturing. So, so explain a bit about what, it, what you're facing in the way of obsolescence problems. This, is, this must be an immense scale for an organization as, as large as yours. Yeah, that's absolutely true. So we run a lot of trains which are even older than I am. I am so we're talking about trains which are 40, 50 years old and also infrastructure, which is even much, much older. And uh, so you can imagine that it's hard to get any spare parts right now. And we wait, wait for spare parts up to two years. So if we can reduce this time by using additive manufacturing to a few couple of weeks or even months, we are absolutely fine with this. So it's a very, very good solution. What types of parts are you finding most promising uh, for the additive program? Um, we've identified a whole range, a very broad range of parts within our corporate. Um, those are plastic parts, but also metal. So two thirds are usually plastic, one third is metal. On the metal side, we use aluminium and steel, sometimes also titanium uh, on the plastic side. So those are um, different uh, PA6, PA12 uh, things, but also flame retardant materials which are very crucial for running trains. Yeah, uh, tell us a bit about the, the uh, safety requirements or the frameworks that you have to operate in. This is a very demanding application. Um, it definitely is. So we have to meet very high safety restrictions. I'm not talking about the spare parts for the coffee machine, which we also do, but um, if we have uh, parts like a headrest, which is used very close to the passenger, then uh, the part, of course, has to meet very high restrictions. Those are usually um, managed by uh, EU regulations, and um, there we really suffer from a lack of materials too. And the logic is for the flame retardants aspect, if we have a plane, for instance, if you compare it to other sectors, when a plane is grounded within 90 seconds, it's emptied. A train might be in a tunnel, has to get out of the tunnel first, and uh, so we need four or five minutes. And there you can see that we uh, need different um, levels of flame retardants, um, which can't be compared to aviation. Interesting. And, and so what materials have you found promising for these kinds of applications? Um, for those applications, uh, we could use Ultim 9085. Um, that's, uh, to be honest, awfully expensive. And um, so we are looking also for a um, cheaper um, material 
uh, which we could use. And uh, so this is why we also got into discussion with other companies to um, find more materials uh, which we could use for different technologies within additive manufacturing. I'd love to know a bit about the process that's involved when you uh, go to replace a part using additive manufacturing. Let's say the, the headrest that you mentioned a second ago. Um, is this a, uh, a shape where you can get a design from the original vendor and sort of go from that? Or do you also have people who have to reverse engineer the original part? Usually we don't have any drawings. If, it's, uh, if we are fine, we have 2D drawings, but this doesn't really help for additive manufacturing. And so uh, we have to re-engineer um, all of our parts. And sometimes we do it with our own resources. We have an engineering department within our company, but sometimes we also do it with uh, uh, service bureaus. And um, usually it works like there is someone in a maintenance workshop he identifies a part and says, oh, this could be printable and um, I need this urgently. Then he puts this part in a box, sends it to our colleagues in Frankfurt, and they decide whether it's printable or not. And then they also decide with which uh, printing service bureau they do this. And uh, I'm always asked uh, how many machines does uh, Deutsche Bahn own? And I can just say, apart from some desktop printers, none. Hmm. So uh, we rely to 100% on printing service bureaus. And is that because uh, you require such a wide range of, um, of printing processes and materials that you can't possibly maintain uh, the machines in-house? Or is it about delivery time or uh, distribution across the world? Um, it's uh, the first uh, factor you just mentioned. It's, it's about um, uh, we would, uh, since we use a lot of uh, different materials and also technologies, um, we would have to have a huge investment if we want to do this ourselves. Furthermore, you need a lot of knowledge to run those machines. And um, since we've already identified a lot of parts, but we can't really um, yeah, do it efficiently with such a huge park of machines, we rely on those printing bureaus. And so we focus on identifying the, the perfect use cases within the, the rail and uh, the others uh, do their, uh, bring in their expertise for printing those parts. Um, you've, you've mentioned a few applications for 3D printing that are kind of uh, interior fixtures on the trains. Um, do you also see 3D printing as a feasible uh, way to produce parts that are, that are you know, truly mechanical or under immense stress? Um, yeah, I think this is really like a development. So usually when you introduce additive manufacturing within a, the company, I would always suggest start with some simple parts. Start with plastic parts. Then get some uh, feeling for the technology and for, for strength, stability and so on. And then automatically you will come to the metal parts. And afterwards you, you try to optimize those. So this is some kind of a development. Um, within ba barn uh, or railways in general, we are often restricted by the um, size of the building rooms. So we would like to have much bigger parts because railways usually are not small, they're quite big. Um, at the moment, this is really a restriction we have to face. But um, I really um, I'm, I'm really enthusiastic because there are so many printing um, machine producers who adopted this need, and uh, now it's getting bigger. Now, Deutsche Bahn is an immense organization, and I imagine it was very complex to introduce additive manufacturing to what is already a very complicated you know, process for managing legacy equipment and, and performing maintenance. Could you tell us a bit about, on the management side, how you've approached the introduction of additive manufacturing at Deutsche Bahn? First, we started and we want to find out the right parts by shaking our SAP systems. And this doesn't work out at all because uh, it, ha it, it has nothing to do with SAP. It's, it has to do with information needed we can't find in our systems. So uh, to do it simple, it should inch it out. So we decided um, if we can't do it top down, then we have to do it bottom up. And uh, at least in, in Germany, we have more than 140 sites. Uh, where we do maintenance and in our first year we already visited 40 of them and asked our colleagues um, try to tell them what the technology is capable to do 
and to bring us some parts. And you could really see it from the faces. Uh, first, they had the prejudice. Those are all technologies with which you can uh, print Pokemon uh, toys and so on. <laughs> so um, we um, gave them the first metal printed part in the hands, two and a half kilogram terminal box made from aluminum. And then you could really see how the face and and the eyes opened, and um, then they really start about thinking, what can we do with additive manufacturing? Our experience is, if you have one or two of those guys who are really enthusiastic about additive manufacturing within one maintenance site, that's enough. Mm -hmm. They bring you more and more parts, and uh, but you also have to train them to a certain extent. So it's sort of a bottom-up process, in addition to the formal management structure that you suggested, there's also a process of sort of winning over the people who are working immediately in the shop. Yeah, exactly. So you also need the commitment of the management, of course. We have the commitment of our board. Um, but you need a lot of communication, also training, and not only training the engineers and uh, the technical guys. You also have to train the procurement colleagues because usually they always compare costs, additive manufacturing, to costs of milling, molding and so on and this is at the moment a bit unfair because usually additive manufacturing loses if you compare both so you also have to train other colleagues um, and to keep on communicating a lot and this is what we do so this year after two years of experience and uh, telling our colleagues uh, corporate wide what we are doing uh, we want to initiate a competition for our uh, employees within the whole corporate now you're also the uh, the initiator and the chair of an organization called mobility goes additive that works in bringing in uh, additive manufacturing not only on railways but also in other fields of the transportation industry what are you seeing from uh, from the the automotive industry the truck building industry the bus industry the aerospace industry how do those differ from what you're working with at Deutsche Bahn um, usually all have one aim and they want to um, emphasize the industrial additive manufacturing and use it for producing parts and spare parts so this is uh, our, our goal within this organization. And of course, each sector has a bit a different topic. So when we started with our flame retardant project, there was an awful accident going on on a German highway and a bus burned very fast, 17 people died. And um, so once in a sudden, it was discussed that uh, bus producers have to meet the same restrictions concern fl concerning flame retardancy as the rail. And this is uh, one of those many points where we were in the same boat uh, at that moment. And uh, so you have a lot of um, topics where you can share knowledge. Also, when you think about change management aspects, if you want to introduce additive manufacturing, I always say it's more a change management project than a technology project. And uh, this is very similar for all of us. Also, questions concerning um, le the legal framework, um, it's also very similar. So you have many, many points also in the digital supply chain, IT, blockchain, and so on and so on, uh, where all those sectors come together and share the same uh, challenges. And uh, this really makes sense to solve those problems together. So are your partners in aerospace and in uh, road transportation also interested in additive principally for uh, replacement parts, or do they have interest in, in other applications? The linkage between those companies is not only replacing parts. Some of them just want to replace them. Others want to produce them and uh, do the management of their after sales, uh, because all of us have a huge um, amount on stock. You see. Deutsche Bahn has uh, parts just for the rolling stock, and we are also doing infrastructure, uh, station management, and so on. Just for the rolling stock, we have parts on stock worth 600 million euros per year. So wow. if we can just reduce it by 5, 7, 10 percent, this is pure cash out. And this is not our, only our driver, um, but also for, for our suppliers and um, other companies, which 
um, have to take care of the after sales management of their parts for long living investments. So machines, they don't have to be um, linked to mobility, but also the machining producers face the same problems. And yeah, this is why Mobility Goes Additive is also extending and expanding into other fields, um, not only other nations, but also other fields. So as, as you look at the program that you're running, what are some developments in 3D printing that you're really excited about right now or that you're looking forward to? What I'm really excited about is that there come up so many new technologies um, and they promise to be uh, much cheaper. The, the costs um, will decrease and this is something which really gives hope to the whole industry. And uh, yeah, I, I'm really curious. There is a very interesting study published by the ING Bank from the Netherlands, and they have different scenarios. And one scenario says that uh, 2040, 50% of all parts worldwide will be printable. And now, of course, we can discuss uh, there's going to be 50, 30, 40%, but the potential is so huge. And we have to prepare now um, to uh, get the full potential. And is there anything that you really want to see from the industry? Uh, if, you, if you were speaking to uh, a lot of people who develop 3D printing technologies, what are the big constraints right now that you're finding? On the one hand, uh, we need more materials. Um, we need bigger parts. So we are often restricted by the build rooms. And uh, yeah, we need many, many more use cases. And the costs are still a bit too high. So, But um, this is also our logic within Mobility Girls Additive. The more companies discover additive manufacturing for, for their uh, needs, the cheaper, the easier it will be for all of us. And uh, I'm really enthusiastic that this will be uh, the case in the following years. Stephanie Brickveda is the head of additive manufacturing at Deutsche Bahn and the chair of the organization Mobility Goes Additive. It's a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much. Stephanie Brickveda is giving a keynote presentation at the Digital Factory Conference on May 14 in Munich. If you'd like to hear her and the other great speakers we've got lined up and meet leaders from a broad cross-section of manufacturing companies, go to digitalfactory.xyz. You'll see the full program there, and you can register with the code PODCAST for a discount. The Digital Factory Podcast is produced by Elise Courier and edited by Inky Stainsworth. I'm John Bruner.